My keynote presentation at Edu Week is why teachers should understand the neuroscience of learning. This is a topic that means the very most to me. There are several reasons that are key why teachers and their students, and indeed global society will benefit when teachers have the foundational knowledge of neuroscience. One is that although there's been incredible progress in what we know about how the brain learns through neuroscience, such as neuroimaging, over the past 10 or 15 years, the new techniques, the new technology will provide even more profound, accurate, specific, and highly dynamic information in the next several years that will even exceed what's gone on in the last 10 years. New techniques such as diffusion tensor imaging and information about networks that connect neurons, that connect areas of the brain that are involved in circuits. That type of information is coming to us with greater accuracy and in greater amounts specific to learning. Who's going to interpret? Who's going to make correlations from that research to what it means in the classroom? It's not going to come from the laboratory neuroscientists for a very good reason, because they are not the classroom teachers and administrators. It's going to be a collaboration among the scientists in the lab and the teachers in the classroom. But more and more, as the research is available, it's going to be the opportunity and the responsibility of informed educators to evaluate the neuroscience research for accuracy, validity, and applicability, to see how the implications of new research can correlate with classroom instructional strategies, curriculum planning, school organization. All of those things will be most productively correlated from the neuroscience to the power of learning in the brain by educators with foundational knowledge in neuroscience. The other most important reason among many that I'd love to share why teachers benefit and students benefit from teachers knowing about neuroscience of learning are that all students, educators, and families are so empowered by knowing, for example, things about the attention system, that especially during the school years, information that becomes and comes in through the attention system is sensory input that's essentially selected involuntarily. We see the things that promote the intake of sensory information that is destined to become learning, and we see the factors that inhibit students' attention to the information teachers are sharing. Neuroscience correlations support strategies of the use of curiosity and prediction to acquire students' attention and essentially open up the flow of input through the attention filter. Those are exciting, and I look forward to sharing those strategies and implications. Another big area of correlation is the emotional filter. This has been discussed by theorists and is certainly recognized by educators that stressed students don't learn as well. Well, we can now see with neuroimaging how there is an amygdala, an emotional switching station that is impacted significantly by stress. Stress such as sustained boredom or sustained frustration for students who already have mastery of something that they're being taught yet again or asked to practice yet again with whole class instruction or teaching for the test when that is what's demanded of educators and administrators. Well, we can now see the neuroimaging influence when this emotional filter is in the high stress state. And indeed, it does reach that with sustained boredom or frustration or students' inability to recognize relevance. 
With that recognition, we also have evidence of what students can do and teachers can help them do to reduce the levels of stress in their amygdala, to reopen the flow of input to the prefrontal cortex, which is where long-term memory needs to be constructed and where the brain's reflective networks can send top-down information and input to reflect before the brain, lower brain reacts to emotional and social situations. So we're seeing more and more ways to influence the impact of stress, such as through mindfulness, and also ways to reduce the stressors that accompany boredom and frustration through things that we've learned even from the video game model, which I'll be talking about ways to increase student buy-in, achievable challenge, frequent feedback that influence the neurotransmitters such as dopamine, which in turn increase the brain's propensity for pleasure, decreased stress, motivation, perseverance, curiosity. So as we've seen from, from neuroscience and when teachers understand the neuroscience behind things that decrease or impair attention or flow of input through the emotional filter. Things that impair and things that promote the patterning and mental manipulation that we see as powerful aspects of what becomes memory and what doesn't. So neuroscience of learning for emotion, for attention, for memory, and also for helping students build their neural networks of highest cognitive, emotion, cognitive and emotional ability, the executive functions that are developing at their most profound rate in the prefrontal cortex during the years they are in school. We've seen in neuroscience how these are networks are part of the last regions of the brain to go through their rapid phase of maturation and myelination. With that are correlations for things we can do to incorporate stimulation of the executive functions throughout learning and assessment. These are such exciting correlations from neuroscience to the classroom that I am looking forward to sharing and to observing what I know will be the aha moments in the excellent educators who will be at the conference who will recognize these are the things they've been doing that work so well, and now they know the neuroscience behind them.